connect for those who who connect it later uh, there's a technical problem with a computer of the originally uh, originally announced first speaker Halil Mutu um, and uh, there seems not to be an easy solution this is why we just agreed to switch order and we might even have to abandon the originally meant to be first talk. However, it's my pleasure now to announce Annika Thiel, who give her presentation on recent results from CBL Zatap's experiment. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Christoph. So I will talk about baryon spectroscopy today and uh, we'll talk mainly about the CBL Zatap's experiment. So if you want to look into the excitation spectrum of the nucleons, there are several different theoretical predictions available. Here on the left side is a constituent quark model shown from 2001, and on the right side is a lattice QCD calculation from 2011. And in each column, there are the predicted states for different quantum numbers shown. And here, for example, on the um, left side in this column, the blue lines are the theoretical predictions compared to the measured state at that time. So keep in mind, this is from 2001. There are a few features uh, which become obvious if you look into the different predictions. For example, there are certain excitation bands. You can see it clearly, for example, here that there's the first excitation band, the second lies here and so on. And a similar pattern can also be observed in the predictions for the constituent quark model. Another feature which can be seen if you, for example, look here in this model at the higher masses, you can see that at that time, more masses, uh, more states at high masses were predicted than have been observed at that time. Um, still, as you can see in one of my last slides, a lot of these dates have been found and there is a lot of investigations why at that time there were so few states at um, high masses. Another feature can be observed if you compare both um, different predictions. So both uh, predictions agree that the first excited state of the nucleon should be a S11 state, so with the quantum numbers one half minus. But in fact, if you look into the reality, you can see that the first excited state with the lowest mass was observed the Roper resonance, which is the P11 uh, 1440. And uh, this mass is much uh, lower than from the first S11 state, which has a mass of uh, 1535. So this is also a confusion which is similar in both different um, theoretical predictions or calculations. And the real question uh, from these different comparisons is, what are the relevant degrees of freedom which we observe inside the nucleons of the different quarks? So do we have equally bound quarks? Do we have some dike-quark system or is it something completely different. So for this, um, you can look into different cross sections as shown on the left. Um, here's a um, photo production, the total cross section in black and different final states in the colored uh, dots. And you can see, for example, that at lower masses, you see some structures. For example, here for the eta final state, you see this S11 dominating, but at higher masses, all different uh, cross sections become rather flat. What's interesting is if you look now what contributes to these cross sections, so which resonance states are available there. Here's a, a picture of the bright Wigner distributions of the um, contributing um, resonance states. You can see that there are some um, resonance states which are quite dominant. For example, the, D, the D13 here, or of course the delta resonance at the lower masses. However, there are also some um, resonance states, which only weakly contribute. For example, here's this uh, P11, which is very small below. And also what comes obvious is that these different resonance states are quite wide. So they are broad and overlapping and you need a partial wave analysis to disentangle this and also to identify the weak resonance contributions here. A useful tool for this are the polarization observables. So if I look into the simplest case of photoproduction of pseudoscalar mesons, there are 16 different polarization observables available. Um, there are three different methods what you can polarize in these experiments. You can either have this uh, incoming photon polarized, unpolarized, linearly or circularly polarized. The target can be polarized in three different directions and you can measure the polarization of the recoiling nucleon. And by this, you can um, 
access different polarization observables. Here are, for example, the single polarization observables, the beam asymmetry or the target asymmetry, and also different double polarization observables, which are shown, for example, here. To measure these observables, we use the CBLZ TAPS experiment, which is located at the ELSA accelerator in Bonn. Uh, we have an electron beam of 3.2 GeV coming in. Here we have a goniometer with different radiator targets to produce photons via Bremsstrahlung. The tagging system to uh, measure the or the, to determine the energy of the created photon via Bremsstrahlung. And uh, here is the target system. The main calorimeter system is uh, located here. It consists of the crystal barrel and the mini tubs detector in forward direction. And the, the nicest feature of it is that um, it has a nearly full four pi angular coverage and is fully phi symmetric. So this is the ideal setup to measure polarization observables. Um, this is a picture of our experimental hall. Like, like it's, yeah, the, um, yeah, it's a recent picture from now and you can see that there's a, the, detector system here. This is a target support structure for our polarized target. And this is a tagging system here. Um, the detectors are um, ideally suited to uh, detect neutral final states. So final states comprising uh, photons. Um, here, for example, you can see the invariant mass of a final state comprising two photons, and you can see a very clear signal of the pi zero and also a clear signal from the eta meson, and both have uh, almost neglectable uh, background. Similarly, you can also look into the um, final state containing four photons, for example, here, and you see a clear signal of the reaction containing two um, pi zero, and also pi zero eta is visible here as the small peaks. As I mentioned before, uh, we have a polarized beam available and we can polarize our target. So there are uh, these observables, these eight observables which become accessible. And for most of these observables, we already took data. I hope you can see they are colored in blue, which uh, where we took data from. And for Pi Zero photo production, we also published all of these data sets as it's listed here. I will show you some highlights of the data published for different final states in the next slides. So one um, data set where we got a really extensive data set is for the double polarization observable E for pion photo production. And E is in fact a helicity asymmetry. That means that we have a photon spin in one direction and the nucleon spin um, can be either parallel or anti-parallel. And depending on the states of these two spins, you can access the um, spin-dependent cross-section, either sigma one-half or sigma three-half. And the asymmetry from these two cross-sections then give you the star polarization observable E. The data shown here on the left side is now um, visible um, for different energy bins. And you can see that we could were able to cover a quite broad energy range from 600 to more than 2 GeV. And we were also able to cover nearly the full angular range. So the data points cover all the range. What's interesting is that if you look, for example, on the, the lower masses, you can see a quite simple structure and um, the, the data points are fitted by the different predictions, which are uh, by the different fits from the partial wave analysis as it's shown here. But if you go to higher masses, you can see that the, the data is fluctuating more and the different partial wave analysis had some trouble to really describe it. And here, uh, a higher data set would be nice. Also, um, this both data sets which are shown here are published uh, in the last years. Another more recent publication comes from the final state containing an eta meson. And for this, uh, we took data of a hydrogen target, so an unpolarized target, in order to extract the beam asymmetry sigma. It is shown here now for higher energies compared to um, previous data from the Graal experiment, which is in black, and also from the class experiment in green. And what you can see is that all the different data sets agree quite well. But you can also see that, for example, if you compare our data set with the previous measurement from class, you can see that we were able to cover a wider angular range. So we have two additional points in backward direction also here in forward direction. 
And the feature of this can be seen if you make a Legendre analysis of the data sets. So you fit the data set by different Legendre polynomials and have a look at the resulting coefficients. Um, two examples are shown here. Um, in blue, again, is our data set, and in green is the data set from class. And you can see that already in the Legendre coefficient, there's it visible that there's a cusp structure directly at the opening of the eta prime threshold. And this is expected by the different partial wave analysis, but it's the first time that this was really visible in a polarization observable. Another example also for the eta final state are the measurements of the two double polarization observables E and G. I already showed you E before, but G uh, features linear polarized photons on a longitudinally polarized target. And what's interesting here is that at the threshold of the observable E, the, the data is quite flat around one, which is also predicted from the different analysis. And as you can see, the higher you get in the um, CMS, the more deviations between the different predictions to the data and the data points are visible. Um, it's quite similar if you look into the observable G, you can see that we don't cover the such a wide um, energy range. This uh, comes from the fact that we did linearly polarized photons here and you only have a certain um, part where you have polarization. So this is a, a smaller data set, but nevertheless, you can see that there are large fluctuations between the different predictions from the partial wave analysis groups. Um, let me come to a slightly different topic. So up to now, I just was, was talking about uh, photo production of a single meson, but you can also have photo production of multiple mesons, for example, two mesons. And this features um, intermediate states. So if you have you excite your proton by a photon, and then it uh, has a de cascading decay via an intermediate uh, nuclear or delta resonance, this can be um, observed in the data if you look into the different Dalits plots as it's shown here. So here's the invariant mass squared plotted of a proton pi zero versus the um, invariant mass squared of the proton versus the other pi zero. And you can see here as horizontal lines that there are some of these intermediate states contributing, for example, here the delta resonance or D13. And if you go to higher masses, you can also see that this F15 is visible in the Dalits plot. This basically means that you really have cascading decays and there are intermediate states. So if you extract polarization observables for this final state, you, will, you are able to really have a look at these intermediate resonances. Um, if you want to measure polarization observables for final states containing two meson, it's uh, much more um, difficult than for a single meson final state because you have more particles in the final state. But you can simplify this by uh, looking just at results in quasi two body kinematics. And this means that you regard, for example, both mesons as a single quasi particle and um, just neglect the angle between them. And by this method, you can extract the same polarization observables as for the case of single meson photoproduction. Here are now some examples shown. This is the observable T, the target asymmetry, and also this um, recoil polarization observable P and the double polarization observable H. Um, for these data sets, there is no previous measurement to compare to. And uh, there were also some predictions from different partial wave analysis, but you can see that these predictions are quite uh, show differences to the measured data, for example, here where the mite analysis is not even in the sign wrong, or here where you see a very strong negative contribution from the data, which is not visible in the predictions at all. We extracted these data sets and we extracted also observables for the full three body kinematics. And um, this will hopefully be published within this year. There's another really recent paper which was published end of last year. Um, and here it was observed in the final state pi zero eta that there was a structure which couldn't be described by the partial wave analysis or by the phase space alone. And there were a lot of discussion and investigations what the, the origin of the structure might be. 
And uh, it turned out that it can be nicely described by a triangular diagram. So if you um, consider that you produce an I0, which gets us back over um, a pi zero and creates then a delta resonance, then you can describe this, this, um, this structure and also the behavior of the structure nicely. And this is in fact, one of the first times where such a triangle singularity can maybe observed in baryon spectroscopy. But let's uh, come to the interpretation of the data sets. Um, what we are actually interested in is uh, to extract the intermediate states and the quantum numbers of the intermediate states. And as you hopefully all know, is that uh, the method to um, access this um, intermediate state is to know the pion multiples, which are often labeled as E, L plus minus or ML plus minus. These multipoles can be composed into four different CGLN amplitudes. These are complex amplitudes depending on the angular um, dependence of the um, particle and also on the center of mass energy. And then can be written as sums over the um, angular momentum up to infinity from the different multipoles and also from Legendre polynomials, which just depend on the angular on the angles of the um, particles. Each of the measured observables can then in turn be also expressed by the CGLM amplitudes as it's shown here, for example, by this uh, beam asymmetry sigma. Can be described by uh, quadratic terms of the CGLM amplitudes or by interference terms between them. And the nice thing what you can do now is if you don't make sum up to infinity, but truncate the sum at a certain order, you will get to a, something that is called a truncated partial wave analysis. And in fact, this can be used like this. So if you have, for example, this observable T here, or this is now called the reduced observable normally, um, it can be described by a sum over coefficients times cosine to the power of um, H. If you now, for example, only use the S and the P wave, so you truncate at an order of one, you can describe T by a constant term plus a constant term times a cosine theta dependence. And if you include then the D waves, you get two additional terms. So the cosine squared and the cosine to the power of three and so on. If you include F waves, two additional terms come in. So what you now in fact can do is you can try to describe your data by the different um, equations which are shown here and see which waves you need to describe your data sets. And this was done in a paper in 2017 where we did this for all the published data sets and um, we used different um, uh, max values to truncate our partial wave analysis. And you can see here the sky chi-squared how this behaves over the um, CMS energy. And for example, if you look at a, um, a T-bin with a low energy, you can see that, um, well, the truncation of L max equals one is not enough to describe it, but um, all the other um, equations can describe the data quite well. If you go then to a um, T-bin in the middle energy range, so 1.8 GeV, so it's somewhere here, you can see that um, the blue curve, which corresponds to L max equals two is not sufficient anymore. And you really need L max equals three to describe the data, which is the red curve here. And finally, if you go to the higher um, energy bins, you can see that the structure becomes more complicated and L max equals three is not sufficient anymore. And you need L max equals four to really, um, yeah, describe the, the run of your data points. So by using this, you can uh, get a first insight what really is the sensitivity of the measured data. And um, what you can also see is that um, the data points at the very edges, so at uh, plus or minus uh, one are really important to get a handle on the contributing uh, waves. But if you want to really extract the quantum numbers of the contributing resonances, you really need to do a full partial wave analysis. And for this, um, all the measured um, data sets were included in three different partial wave analyses, here from the Bongaccia group, Julich Bonn, and also from the site group. 
and they compared the multiples before they included our data sets and afterwards. And this is shown here on the right side. Here's just one example shown. This is the M1 minus multiple for pion photo production. And you can see, for example, that in this region, there are some deviations visible before they included the data sets, but afterwards, the, the curves become much more similar than before. Uh, what's still visible is that at the higher masses, there are large deviations visible also after including this data sets. And this comes due to the fact that we don't have very much data in this region. So here would be nice to see more measurements to really constrain these curves. To get an overall feeling how well this worked, so what our data sets really, um, how they improved the different analysis, there was an investigation where they included the variance um, of the three different models without the observables and with the observables that you can see that this variance strongly decreases by including the different um, polarization measurements. So let's have a look at the different uh, resonances. So what did we learn from this? Um, until 2010, there were mostly pionuclein scattering data in the PDG. And now since then, there were a lot of improvement by the new uh, data from photo production. There were a lot of new resonances found, which are shown here in uh, red, and there were also different final states which have been investigated in detail. And they were really the case where we were we expected for a while that there are in fact resonances, for example, here, where you don't see a very strong coupling to a pionucleon, but a very strong coupling to photonucleon. Yeah, so this means that these are the, uh, these resonances are more likely to be discovered in photoproduction than in pionuclear scattering. But um, since we are on a workshop where we discuss in general about the topic of Heron spectroscopy, so not only baryons, I want to talk a little bit briefly about baryons and mesons at the same time. So if you're looking for example in the final state, we have a proton hitting a photon hitting a proton and you have two pi zero and a proton in the final state. There are different um, different ways how to how these this um, reaction can take place. And if you go to higher energies, there are three likely cases which can happen. So there are also um, reactions in the U channel, but I don't want to talk about these here, but um, let's just focus on the exchange in the T channel. So first of all, you can have a, um, a vector meson exchange here in the T-channel between the um, photon and the pi zero and also the proton. Then it forms here a nucleon resonance, which then decays, for example, by a proton and the pi zero. Or you can have the case where you have a vector meson exchange between the proton and the photon. Then you build here a meson resonance, which then decays um, under the mittens of two um, mesons. And you can have, have the third case, which is the most difficult one, in my opinion, where you have the deck effect, where you have uh, the third, the, the second pi zero emitted um, in this uh, vertical exchange. But nevertheless, so these two or these three different, um, yeah, this three different um, reactions can take place. And if you look carefully in the data, it, as it's shown here, so this is the data from my analysis of the GLUX data, where, you, where I plotted the invariant mass squared of the proton uh, pi zero versus invariant mass squared of uh, both pi zero. And you can see that you see very strong horizontal lines. So these are the meson resonances. But at the same time, you see also some vertical lines, which are the baryon resonances. So both are produced in the same reactions. And here comes now the difficult task, because if you want to really just investigate your meson resonances, you need also to have a look at the baryon resonances because they will influence your spectrum. And there are certain options what you can do with this. So what would be the ideal case is to remove just the background of the baryon resonances, but I'm not sure this will be possible. And the second option would be to describe the background. But for both of these different options, you need to know how the baryon spectrum in fact looks like. And this is a crucial part if you want to achieve high precision meson spectroscopy. 
So let me come to my conclusion. Um, I hope I could show you that uh, with the CBL Tops experiment, we measured several different reactions with polarized photons and protons, and we extracted a lot of different polarization observables over a wide energy range. Several data sets have been published now, most of them for pi zero and eta, but other channels like, for example, two pi zero will follow hopefully this year. Um, we looked into the data with the truncated partial wave analysis first and get the first sensitivity of the observables. And this method is currently further extended by using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlos and Bayesian inference. Then uh, the data sets were included in the different partial wave analysis. And what we could see is that, in fact, the multipoles are converging, which is very promising because this is what we hoped for. Um, in the last years, the main calorimeter was being upgraded for a higher detection efficiency for photo production of the neutrons. And this is a topic where I didn't talk about at all because um, all the data I showed was on the proton, which is much easier to accomplish. But um, the data of the neutron is quite sparse. And we are now also able to really measure their decent data sets and extract their um, polarization observers. And hopefully, um, these new polarization data will help to finally understand the resonance spectrum and give a fruitful impact for the different quark models or lattice QCD calculations. And as a last slide, I want to um, highlight that uh, we have recently written a, a review paper about light barrier spectroscopy, which has um, been accepted by Progress in Particle and Nuclear Physics. It's already available on the archive and on the web page and will be in print in the next days. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annika, for this very nice overview. Questions? I see Aloch, you raised his hand. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Annika, I mean, uh, can you go there to this slide? I mean, of the, the triangle singularity of the yeah, sure. work of von Kamekra. Yes, of course. As you know, I, I had, exactly, I had many, many, many discussions with the Fonka, many, many I mean, discussions. And uh, it is true, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, we checked, I mean, that this uh, diagram that you have there fulfills the rules of triangle singularity. I even here insisted that I calculated it, in, but I don't know how to, because I don't know the first vertex, I don't know how to calculate. Now, the, you made a comment, this observation of say, singularity in baryon spectroscopy. Before that, I mean, there is one already, I mean, uh, yes. in the same reaction, in the same reaction, in the gamma proton into pi zero proton reaction, pi zero eta uh, proton reaction. Uh, in 1970, I mean, we wrote the paper, I mean, by De Bastiani and, and Sakai, in which we show, I mean, there, there was a triangle singularity for the channel gamma proton going to pi zero n star 1535. And the n star 1535 would decay later into eta proton. Oh, so, really? I don't know this paper. <laughs> you don't know, but Volker Metak knows very well. Yeah. And that's why he, you know, I mean, they went into looking at these other triangle similarity. Okay. I mean, they, he, he, he knew that work very well. And that's why he was, I mean, prompted I mean, to go and see if that is anomaly would be due to a triangle similarity. But anyway, okay. this work is, uh, and we reproduce the data of goods. Yeah, I mean, uh, we reproduce nicely the data of goods, which is nice. This I could calculate. The one of Fonka, sorry, I would be glad to do, but I mean, I don't know how to calculate. Yeah? Anyway, that was the comment. Okay, thank you very much. I will look into this paper. I really don't know. Ask, ask Fonka, I mean, he will okay, tell you. Okay, I will do that. Well. <laughs> Thanks. Well, actually, I have a question to exactly this very diagram here. Yeah, go ahead. I'm a little surprised that uh, you have a triangle singularity here in the very channel where you also get a three level contribution from your resonance going directly to pi zero eta via the A naught and a proton. Doesn't the Schmidt theorem prohibit this triangle singularity <laughs> to occur? Uh, can That's I so say funny, something? I love it. it was a serious question. Can, I know, I know, I know. I am no, I'm laughing. I mean, I mean, uh, praisingly because I mean, you 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 touch a point. Yes, yes. I I discussed that a lot. I mean, with Foka Meta. That's why I'm laughing. Can I say something about? Yes, sure, go ahead. Yes, it is true. You know, I mean, uh, in the diagram that you have there, I mean, there is a, <laughs> seems, I mean, to be, I mean, a conflict with a, a Smith theorem because, you know, I mean, you have rescattering of the same, of the same, I mean, state that you have. 
However, I mean, uh, I have a, a long, long and very thorough paper on uh, Smith theorem, you know, I mean, and, and, uh, and then I clarify things. This is the Smith theorem. I mean, it tells you that you just have there the rescattering of the particles which you have in the loop. Then it, you, you shouldn't see the singularity. You shouldn't see, I mean, the, the effect of this diagram into the cross section uh, because it is already, uh, uh, I mean, taken into account. But this is only on in the integrated cross sections. If you look to invariant mass distributions and you look, I mean, at, at angular distributions, you can see that in principle. Second thing, you know, is that uh, the theorem only holds exactly, you know, when the, in the limit, when the width of the particle there in the width in the, in the loop, in this case would be the zero, the zero 980, when this has zero width. In this case, the theorem holds. But if you are away from that, I mean, the, the theorem is not exact. And then our conclusion there is, please calculate, because I mean, it will give some contribution. Yeah? And there was another thing also is that if this, if this uh, uh, also it only holds, I mean, exactly the Smith theorem when you have only one channel, you know, when you have just elastic channel. But in proton pi zero, I mean, you have also in, a, in elastic channels because you could have, I mean, pi plus neutron, for example. And then as soon as you have elasticities, I mean, then the theorem doesn't hold either. Yeah? So in summary, I mean, uh, 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 Smith theorem is beautiful, but, uh, Calculate it eh? because <laughs> there is always some contribution and you have something to learn. But um, Annika, is this is the tree level contribution that we were just discussing already also in the calculation that you really have the, the tree level resonance going to A0980 proton and then the A0 decays to pi naught uh, eta? Is that already in and the proton goes to pi naught proton? I'm not exactly sure how this was calculated. This was the same code which was also used by the Coppas group mm -hmm. where they saw this triangular um, singularity and they provided us the code for calculation. But sure, I but you have to put in the additional tree level contribution. Yes, of course, but I don't know if this was done. Between tree level and triangle. Yeah, because sure. although, although Elohio is completely right that if you have inelastic channels, uh, the, um, the uh, constellations aren't exact anymore, but you usually still get a trace of those constellations. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. I have to ask Volker. I don't Very know good. how we did it. Are there any further questions, comments, or remarks? Well, I don't see any hands raised, uh, but I see that the uh, first speaker is back. Thank you very much, Annika. Then we should quickly Thanks. switch to the... Um,